You know, Chaz, uh, when he brought that word, it really lined up with <clears throat> what I think God is wanting to do here today. Amen. Basically what he was saying and kind of what the Lord has to say today, today is a defining moment in your whole life. Um, and I'll get to that a little bit later, but... Uh, this is Palm Sunday. Uh, did, you rec- did you realize that this morning? You know, I, I love to call it Passion Sunday. Some people refer it to Passion Sunday, some, some Palm Sunday, maybe more the secular world. But it's the beginning of uh, the week before Jesus was crucified for our sins. And that's important. And the defining moment in the Lord's life was the cross. It was the garden. There were times in his life to where when he was filled with the Spirit and the Lord said, this is my son who I am well pleased. But his defining moment caused him to come to a place in his life to where the rest of his life he was anointed to populate heaven. And that's what we should be as servants of the Lord. Saved people. And I'll read from the text uh, if you would stand, let's just read from the text, honor God's word this morning. I'm going to read from uh, 1 John 4. If you don't have your Bibles, uh, it's on the screen, verses uh, 12 through 16. And this is maybe how Jesus, even himself, and the apostles understood the how, and, and even though they couldn't see God, but, but how they developed to be a person to populate heaven. Verse 12, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, let's say that together. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that The Father has sent the Son as the Savior of the world. And whoever confesses Jesus is the Son of God. God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. And the only way that you will ever see God in this life is through his working of love flowing through you to others. And that's by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, which basically it's impossible for you to love with the nature of the Holy Spirit without you being filled and allow that empowerment to work in your life. Amen? So I ask you, what is, before we sit down, what is your passion in life? And you will see this, that your life will pass as a week so rapidly. And you'll get to the end of that time and you'll think, what did, I love Jesus, but what did I do? What kind of fruit did I bring? Last Sunday, Pastor Bob read the account of the triumphant entry. And I would say this. If you will allow Jesus to have a triumphant entry into your life with his spirit, that entry of love can affect thousands, thousands in your lifetime. But you have to live, allow it to manifest in a full power in you to be able to do that Monday through Sunday. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord. I ask you today... Cause us to to hear what the Spirit of God says. And at the end of the service, may everyone be filled with your Spirit. Save to God be the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. The history of what took place on the first Holy Week. Sunday. Palm Sunday. Uh, The first day of the Holy Week commemorates Jesus' triumphant entry and into the Jerusalem riding on a donkey, and, and uh, he was greeted by a large crowd. 
with palm branches and people shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. But mostly looking for an earthly king to rule them. Large crowd. Still only a remnant of the Roman Empire actually knew him as Christ, the eternal king. On Monday, the next day, we call it Holy Monday. And that's where Jesus went in and he cleared the temple. And he said, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Tuesday, Fig Tuesday maybe, you, they call it. Blessed by the, he, uh, where Jesus had passed by the f- withered fig tree that he cursed on the day before because it had no fruit. And then he went to the Mount of Olives to pray and Judas negotiates the betrayal on Tuesday. On Wednesday, we call it Spy Wednesday, where Judas became a spy in the midst of of the disciples. It was a day that Jesus rested in, in Bethany, they think, and he waited for the Passover meal with his disciples. Thursday, they call it Monday Thursday, where it was a somber day, a somber day for the Lord and and the disciples awaiting the cross of Calvary. Passover, Jesus washed his disciples' feet, and they had the Last Supper. And he told them, do this in remembrance of me. On Friday, we call it Good Friday. The final hours before the Lord's death and Judas' betrayal kiss and the arresting of the Lord by the Sanhedrin. Late that night, the Lord endured multiple trials, and he was whipped, and he was beaten. Final trial, Judas goes out and hangs himself. Peter denied Jesus three times in the courtyard. Saturday, Easter vigil, we call it maybe. Jesus' body lay in the tomb as a remnant of believers awaited the greatest day on the eternal calendar, which is Sunday, next Sunday. On Sunday, I think we missed the point by really calling it Easter Sunday. I love to call it Resurrection Day. Amen? Because that is a day of our victory. That is a day of our hope. That is a day of our redeeming grace. Can we give Jesus some praise in this place for coming out of the cross and redeeming our soul that we have salvation and a blessed hope? Amen? And then all of history from that week to now of 2022, where are we with Passion Week? Where are we with Palm Sunday? Where are we, are we with the essence of Easter? No other person born that has that has endured history as the person of Jesus Christ. No other person can take away your sin. No other person can heal your body. No other person can raise you from the grave when you're dead. No other person is building you a mansion in heaven. No other person can love you like Jesus. No other person can fill your heart with purpose for this life. I just wish everybody knew him. Palm Sunday, 2022, is where we're at today. A weekend that the secular people will go to the malls and they'll buy their Easter garb. They'll shop for clothes for next week. All the house will be full next week. In every church across America. The majority. That is a majority where people are interested in this man named Jesus, but they don't really know him. They will come on the big day. They call Easter. The majority, not much has changed really since the first Palm Sunday. Jesus overlooked their city and he wept. And I think he still weeps today. Much like today, the Roman leader of the world ruled with his signature of his pen. Just like ours. A people that is conforming to a secular ideology. 
where Christianity is suppressed at every place. The Via Della Rosa. Oh, it was a remnant of people there as well. They came to worship him while a greater number was hearing about the bigger event later that week. The majority at that time didn't really know him. He was an interesting man, man of miracles, spiritually interested in even, but not really interested in knowing him. Sadly, though, the majority on that first Palm Sunday just came to observe with no real change in their heart or their mind. Yet he offered himself to everyone. Even some came to lay down the palm leaves and shout praises, showed up the next week voting to crucify him because he wasn't the king of their hearts. Today, Holy Week, 2022, I really believe this. Just like then, I believe if we would take a poll in the United States of America, the majority would vote to crucify Jesus to get him out of their conscience, out of their schools, out of their city halls, out of their football stadiums, and off their money. They'd lock up the pastors, the prophets, the teachers, the evangelists, and the apostles. They'd burn the churches and throw away the key. Next Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, the greatest a church attendance of all the year of 2022. They'll come and they'll hear about this miracle of God, Jesus. They'll hear about him being the risen Savior, the Prince of Peace, the light to the world, that he came, he died, and he was risen. And he even ascended, and he's coming back for all those that call him Christ. Oh, the church will see him again next year, should the Lord tarry. They'll go buy their clothes on this Sunday, and they'll be in the church in 2023, should the Lord tarry. Still, just not really wanting to know him. Why? They live in a world where Christians are suppressed, so they don't want to stand out. They simply love the world. Number two is the other, que- other reason. They love the world more than they love this Jesus as Savior. The majority, sadly, are on a flaming road to hell. The remnant, you, we're here to flag them down. Romans chapter 11, verse 5 says, At the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace, and you are the conduit of love that Jesus has chosen. And by the grace of God you have been chosen to change the world just like Jesus did. You're a chosen remnant. A walking, talking testimony of salvation to every lost person you see. You are the essence of God's nature of love. And Jesus is saying once again to us all today, Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. The essence of Easter. Essence, the word The definition of essence is the basic, real, and invariable nature of a thing or its significant individual feature or features. See, as as freedom is the very essence of democracy, love is the very essence of a life in Christ Jesus. And you and me, point to yourself, guys, you You are carriers of Christ's nature of love. They're not going to see Jesus walking through Nashville, Tennessee, or Mount Juliet. It's you. And this is saying that if you have come to come to a place in life where that is exactly who you are through and through, in every situation, in every circumstance, to yourself as well as others. And when you can get there... 
then you can carry the weight of the grace of Christ. And you can live in a power and the life surrendered to Christ completely, totally. And that's when life changes. Before I talk about to you about the essence of God's love, exactly how did Jesus' human life affect those who were lost in sin? What was he teaching us to do? What changed in people when the Holy Spirit in him transformed his human nature to carry the essence of God's love? What changed when Jesus walked into a room? How did Jesus say to the lost, to the hurting, I love you? Six ways Jesus' life was the essence of love and still is to us today. Number one, he was inviting. The Lord was inviting. He always invited others to be with him and around him, but he really was trying to lead them on a journey to heaven. The Christian hospitality, basically all of us should be able to be there. To be a person of Christian hospitality. To be the essence of love. The Lord, the woman at the well, he offered her living water. Just another day in the life of Christ. Mary and Martha's house, he simply brought his presence into the room. We can all do that wherever you go. Zacchaeus. Poor Zacchaeus was up in a tree, in a sycamore tree, and he was looking for Jesus to see. With all the multitude around, all the things that Jesus had to do and say, or could have gone, he asked Zacchaeus to come down. He says, I'd like to go to your house today. So he was willing to sit with sinners. The gentleman on the road to Emmaus, they were down and out. Their Christ had been killed. All, th- every, all their hope they thought that they could see was gone. Jesus walks up and just starts taking a walk with them, and he brought them comfort. So Jesus was inviting, but he, not only was he inviting, but the Lord taught us how to care. He was caring. He listened to them when they talked, when they were hurting. He listened to them. He encouraged them. He brought healing words. He guided others with the knowledge and the understanding of God's word. He had a heart of compassion. You look at Psalm 23 and you read that and you see the story in the person of Jesus. He cared for the sheep, even the stinky ones. He Cared for the lost ones. He, he cared for the broken ones. He gave guidance and wisdom. He gave them protection. He gave them healing and comfort. And he always left them with goodness and mercy. Not only was Jesus inviting and caring, but Jesus was also available to the people. He was not too busy. Jesus spent time with people. He visited the poor and the widows and the orphans. He ate with others. He worshiped with others. He washed their feet. He was the way, the truth, and the life of God's love to others. He was also a heart changer. What did he do first? He personally himself hosted the Holy Spirit. He didn't do it out of his human nature. He did it out of the nature of God that was in him. He hosted God's spirit. He carried the presence of God wherever he went. He ministered to his father as he, whatever he was doing. And he was the fruit of God to others as he blessed the people. Galatians 5, verse 22 through 23. Jesus was and still is the fruit of our spirit. In love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. He was the picture of that. He was the essence of love. And through the power of the Holy Spirit that, that it dwells within us, all of those attributes should be a part of our soul to other people. He was also purposely serving. The Lord was a purposeful server to everyone. In Mark 
10, 45, Jesus testifies for himself. He said, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. See, everything that Jesus did, and get this, kind of what Chaz was talking about. Everything Jesus did was eternally driven. See, if we can get that, no matter if you're going on the job or, or whatever, you're cutting your lawn, your neighbors are out front and they're driving back past your house. Rather than snore them, just wave at them when they go by. They know you're a Christian. But he, he was eternally driven. And he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So he was the hope of salvation to everyone, every day, and everywhere. Luke 4, 18 says, the spirit of the Lord. And you need to take this personally, okay? This is just not the words of the Lord. But you read this scripture and we need to take this personally. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me and you to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent you to heal the brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty and to the captives to recover the sight to the blind and to set the liberty to those who are oppressed and proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So you are the essence of God's love. He was also the overflow of God's love. Working in his human soul, his human spirit. In John 5, 19, the Lord, the word, Jesus told us the key to his favor to people. He says, I can guarantee this truth. The son cannot do anything on his own. That means in his person, his human person. He can only do what he sees the father doing. Indeed, the son does exactly what the father does, which means... Jesus, in the morning, you know the stories in the different times in the Bible where he went and he basically locked eyes with his father. He spent time of intentional devotion and prayer to his father. So I ask you, how long has it been since you really locked eyes with God? Today is a defining moment of your eternal existence. At Calvary, Jesus completed his days on earth as a man, but he passed the cross to each of us as his hope of salvation to our personal world, wherever your, wherever your circle is, basically. And Jesus says in Luke 9, 23, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow him. Which means that this is where it happens to where if you take that, that mandate of what the Lord has put in our, in our hands to take up our cross daily and follow him in the things that he did. Being inviting, being caring, being available, being a heart change, or purpose, purposely serving to be an overflow of God's love. And I want to read what I think is where the Lord is passing the cross to us. He did his part. But he's given this passage and the transferring of picking up your cross and following him. And it, the passage begins in uh, John 14. It's not, it's a, it's a con, kind of a conglomerate of some scriptures I pa picked out so we can just read on the screen as I read what the Lord is saying to us this morning. And this is uh, John 14, begin with verse 19. A little while longer, 
and the world will see me no more, which means he's, he's passing the cross to someone. But you will see me because I live, you will live also. At that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. And this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my Father. I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. And that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. But I think this is the beautiful passing of the mandate of what Jesus came to do. And he showed how to do these things. And now he's saying, you do it. And today, Jesus is commissioning us to live the essence of his love. And to, to work out of the overflow of God's presence in our own life. Definition of the essence in a, in a person. I look this up. It's the core nature or most important qualities of a person. The most defining thing that you live with. Are you eternally driven? If you are, then you automatically. Jesus didn't have to work on those things that he was doing. It worked from an overflow, from the Spirit of God that dwells. It was easy to do those things. Jesus told his disciples, I'm leaving, but you will see me as you continue in my essence of love to your purpose, to bear fruit for the kingdom of God. You have been given my indwelling spirit, my own spirit, to do these things. Pastor Bob asked you earlier to take these cards. This week, there are people, if you will grasp the anointing of the Holy Spirit and it He'll lead you to someone that is lost. Someone is hurting. This is easy. Got all the information here. But just take yourself like Jesus did. So, now how about you? Six ways your life can be the essence of love. Really, it's the same thing. Number one, be inviting. Jesus has showed us how to do that. He was the example of that. Daily you're inviting others to be with you forever in whatever you're doing if you're eternally driven. I walked into Walmart 
to get some church supplies of a couple weeks ago and 630 I believe and Martha Dale was I heard her voice behind me hey pastor I love you and she's on the phone so she's walking she's walking down here and she's kind of talking to me but she's talking to someone after she got off because I heard her tell that person I love you 630 in the morning okay okay so I asked her after she got off the phone, I said, Martha, who, who were you talking to? She said, my high school teacher. I call her about every day, ever so often. I said, do you realize that you, show, you told two people I love you, and it's not even 6.30 in the morning? Pastor Chaz, he's a plumber. He tells me about the stories where he, He's eternally driven. He's, he's trying to fix their pipes and, and leaking pipes and their air conditioners, but while he is there, he's carrying the presence of God. And a lot of times at the end of the day, he's praying for the person when he's giving them that big, that small, that small check. <laughs> trying to help you out, Chad. Pastor Kenny and I, when we started uh, pastoring, Pastor Davis, Laurie Davis, took us on a little field trip to teach us how to do hospital ministry. And down here at Summit, I remember we were walking in, and all three of us walking in, all of a sudden, he's gone. I thought, where'd he go? He kneeling, kneeling down with some lady. You remember this, Candy? I think she had lost someone or someone was about ready to pass away. But he walked through the crowd slowly. He's walking with us. He, he's on his job, but he took a moment just to be inviting Young man named Alex at our job probably 12 years ago. He, he's in Argentina now. He, he was an Argentinian, and uh, he worked for us for about two years, and a and very quiet gentleman. And uh, after one morning, he came in, and he said, can I talk to you? I thought, oh, he's quitting. And uh, he, so I took him in my office. I thought, well, he's going to give me a resignation. He says, uh, let me ask you something. I've been here for about six months. All y'all are different. So what's, what's different? I spent about 30 minutes with him and led him to the Lord. So you have to be inviting. You have to carry a Christian hospitality because Hebrews 13, 2 says, Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. That's pretty profound. So you, not only should we be like Jesus and inviting, but should, we should be caring. We should care for people. Galatians 6, 2 says, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. All this book. All you got to do is love. Listen to the brokenhearted. Bring healing words. Be a God of knowledge of God's word and the power of the Holy Spirit flowing out of your life. Ask the Holy Spirit to develop a heart of compassion in you if you don't have that. The Lord healed him with compassion. Be available. Spend time with people. It all ain't about your world, okay? Spend time with people. Visit the down and out. Be known as an encourager. Eat with others. Get the picture? All, all this stuff Jesus did. He showed us how to do it. Be the fruit of God's love to others. Be the person of the way and the life and the truth. Be a heart changer. Get up in the morning. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Host the Holy Spirit. Carry the manifesting presence of God. Minister to God all through your day. Be the fruit of God to others as you bless the people. Galatians 5, again with verse 22 and 23. Be a person of an overflow heart of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Be a person of purposefully serving. Every minute of every day on this earth matters because... You are a triumphant entry every day into someone's world. You are a virtual picture of salvation to everyone, every day, everywhere. Be the overflow of God's love 
1 John 4, verse 16 through 17 says, We know and rely on the love of God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us. I love the picture of the vine I read earlier. The Lord is the vine. We are the branches. And then we produce new fruit. Which means everybody that you see is benefiting from the nature of love and the essence of love that is flowing as an overflow from your heart. All that's in you. All you got to do is tap it out. Just tap into it every morning. The essence of love. You should be an image of Jesus. An actual image. Mirror image of Jesus, of the source of eternal salvation. 1 John 5, 11 says, This is the true testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life has its source in his Son. You should be also a fragrance of Christ. You should, your spirit... The, your, your human spirit married with the Holy Spirit should smell like Jesus. The Holy Spirit of Jesus in you is like the fragrance of a high quality perfume to everyone in the room. You should leave the scent of heaven on everyone. 2 Corinthians 2.15 we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being, being saved and among those who are perishing. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Follow God's example. Therefore, as dearly loved children, walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Don't tell me you don't have opportunities to be a fragrant offering of love to everyone, every day, and everywhere. Your soul, where your emotions are at, should sing like Jesus. You should be a harmony of heaven. An essence of God's nature of love in you is like the harmony of heaven when we are loving others like Jesus. Psalm 133, verse 1. See how good and pleasing it is for brothers to be living in harmony. Things you say can be a melody from heaven's throne room everywhere you go to everyone Every day, everywhere. The essence of Jesus in your voice. When you speak, your, your voice, they should hear, the law should hear a melody of heaven. No matter what you're saying, if you're operating from a right place. Amen? And as I close today, Bert, if you could come up. We live in a world that is broken in every way. Broken. You see them. They're, they're broke. And because Jesus brought his heart of love to the cross, we can be the essence of love to our broken world. And like a thermostat, if you have the opportunity to set the temperature everywhere you go into every room, and Jesus is saying, my son, my daughter, will you carry my message? Will you carry my message? Will you pick up your cross daily and follow me? And the next thing he's asking that you have to get there on is, do you love me? You got to have my love in my heart to see this. I love the, the story, last chapter of John. At the breakfast at the Sea of Tiberias, the Lord came. He was, uh, I think this is a, a great 
picture of love and salvation and love and redemption. He was trying to redeem his, especially Peter. And there were seven disciples there. And, you know, Peter, they had all made all these proclamations. And, and he's around six other disciples. And he says, hey, I'm going fishing. And all of them says, I'm, let's go fishing with you. In other words, that was like an escape to go back to do what they were doing before. All night they fished, no fish. Next morning, Jesus was on the shoreline cooking fish, cooking their breakfast. So he hollers out to them, and they're, he's taught them to be fishers of men. He, they knew that, that they're out there fishing for fish. So he calls to them and says, do you have any fish? And they said, no. To cast your nets on the right side of the boat, you will find some. Their nets filled. And when Jesus recognized it was the Lord and he saw that defining moment that he'd already made, that he'd already made a, a passion and that he was going to follow Jesus, and that you can depend on me, even though he had denied him three times, he, he jumps out of the boat, defining moment, and swims to Jesus and the rest of them take their fish and they get to the bank. Knowing Peter had denied him three times, during breakfast, he says to Peter, I think he's talking about the fish. Do you love me more than these? He says, yes, Lord. Jesus says, feed my lambs. He asked him again, do you love me? Peter answers, yes, Lord. He says, tend my sheep. He asked him a third time, do you love me? He says, yes, Lord, you know all things. He says, feed my sheep. And if we would just stop our world for a minute in all of our busyness and look Jesus in the eyes, we all would see that we really do love Jesus more than anything. And when we do that, we love exactly what Jesus loves. And we become a person of center-driven love in the essence of love, which is the Holy Spirit that's already planted in you if you're a Christian. Jesus told his disciples, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. The scripture says, and with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. We are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, the scripture says. Which means the whole weight of heaven went everywhere that Jesus went. The question you have to answer, am I a disciple? Am I an ambassador of Christ? Does my life carry the message of Jesus? Do I carry the essence of Jesus' love to others? See, there's two defining moments that cut to the true center of a Christian. That, just like Peter, cut, it cut to the center of who he was. And it got down to what was really most important about his life. And he knew that he was eternal driven, but yet he allowed the world to kind of go back fishing, that sort of thing. Number one, when Peter died, He still will meet judgment day, just like all of us, with what you did for your life. Number two, when Jesus asked, do you love me? And he said, feed my sheep. The Lord's asking that. Asked, he asked Peter that, and he had to answer. I think the Lord is asking you, do you love him? Will you feed his sheep? Each of us were born with a purpose to minister to God and to bless the people. With that, you have to make a confession of salvation and you have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I know this, for my life, there's two things that I, don't, I would not go outside my house without. Number one, 
And if I could ask Pastor Bob to come over here, Pastor Candy, do each of y'all have oil? Did you give him oil? Okay. Okay, guys, this is a defining moment. You may be saved. You may not be saved. You may, if you are saved, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. It's just a matter of, of an, that anointing of power that causes you to, to be an eternally driven person without shame. That's a defining moment. But being saved with one act of love, Jesus bridged the gap between hate and love and heaven and hell. And that it was the only way to the Father was through Jesus. 1 John 5, 11 says, God has given us eternal life. This life has its source in the Son. John 15, 13 and 14 says, Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And the Lord is saying, He's done that, and ye are my friends. So I ask you, with everyone standing, does your heart belong to Jesus? Does your heart belong to Jesus? I'll give you instructions in a minute. The second thing I would not go out of my house with is the empowerment of His Spirit. The authentic source of manifesting love can only come through the, the empowering Spirit of God. The empowering, indwelling Holy Spirit. So my offer to you this morning is a new nature that reflects in the natural to others as well as the supernatural to your Father in heaven. So here's what I'd like for you to do. There's an aisle here. And Pastor Candy's here. There's an aisle here. An usher will help you and Pastor Bob here. They both have anointing oil. Okay? And here's what I want you to do. If you're coming for salvation and you're coming to Pastor Bob or Pastor Candy, tell, they'll ask you what you're coming for. But here's the other thing. I don't care where you're at or where you think you're at. All of us can use a touch of anointing from the Holy Spirit to give us a boost out of this place to be anointed, to be eternally driven to where you light your life will be affect thousands from now to bear fruit for the kingdom so I want you to just get out in the aisles usher I want an usher here to help one over here one at a time I want you to line the aisle on this side line the aisle on this side uh, brother Jimmy's here brother James over here one at a time will come down pastor Bob will pray for you or pastor Candy you, act, you tell them what you need, whether it's salvation or empowerment, whatever, whatever it is. Just go ahead and move.
Just lift your voices. Lift your voices. Just begin to thank you.
Thank you for your words. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. How many of you received from the Lord this morning? Come on, raise your hands. I hope you got something from God this morning. Just like what the Lord spoke to me as well. We are called to be a blessing to people. We are called to minister to the Lord. We're called to carry His presence. Not just here inside the church, but as we go out. Amen? Come on, let's give Him praise one more time. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Thank you, Lord, for what you're about to do. First service, Lord, even more powerful in the second service. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory, Lord. We're going we're gonna to continue in the attitude of worship and prayer as we go out today. God bless you all. I hope to see you. We hope to see you all this Wednesday and for Easter next week. Invite someone. Amen. God bless you all.